Welcome to the Living Faith at Home podcast. This podcast is designed to inspire and encourage you to follow Jesus and live your faith at home. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us at the Living Faith at Home podcast. Pastor Victor here. In today's episode, we're talking to Molly Backus about how she's making the most of this time and the things God's working in her life. Hello, Molly. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for uh, zooming in. Uh, Molly and Jeff uh, went on their honeymoon right as everything started shutting down in Rhode Island. And so literally, um, you got an awkward call from your pastor while you were on your honeymoon. Uh, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> you did. Uh, but so you got off a plane and got back to Rhode Island and were told that you had to self-quarantine for 14 days. What was yeah. that like? It was it was very strange because while we were gone, everything was sort of happening, like you said. And so we had no idea of like what we were, it almost felt like we were coming back to a foreign country because we had no idea what it would look like. You know, our parents had told us different things and we were sort of like, oh my gosh, like, well, what is it going to be like? And we had to go through the airport in New York. So we, that was actually probably like the most nerve wracking part of it. Cause we were like, everyone's like showed us pictures of these horrible things and Anyway, we got home, honestly, like, so easily. It was very, it was very nice, but kind of surprising. And then, so then Jeff and I were together. We had been on vacation for like 11 days. Um, and then we were home together for two weeks. And actually, we loved it. It was honestly so nice. It was just like a continuation of our honeymoon. And um, I think it was just, a, it was a huge opportunity for us. I know it was, um, inconvenient for our jobs and things that we weren't there but it was just huge for us to yeah. actually spend time here together rather than yeah. just like we were in the sun and having a great time together yeah so. yeah yeah uh for those of you that don't know uh molly is a vet and jeff is a vet tech and you've like since you've been married have had like totally different schedules one working at night one and um so not only did you get your honeymoon but then the gift i mean like thank god you weren't sick and you were right. yeah. fine during that time <laughs> But you had that extra time and uh, you did some puzzles, I saw. <laughs> we did, yeah. I mean, he tried out different beers that he hadn't had a chance to and all that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So that was like two months ago. Yeah. And wow. you're back, you're back at, you went back to work and um, you've had a little bit of a different life. What, what are some of the things that you've been learning since this pandemic started? Like, you know, what, what's, What's some of the things God's been showing you since then? Yeah, so I did go back to work at what, what is, I don't even know the day, but I went back to the work, I think at the beginning of April. Um, and so like my work week is the same. I sort of, those days when I'm at work are basically the same other than that I wear a mask at work. But because there's nothing else to do outside of work, um, I feel like the Lord's kind of given me the opportunity to reacquaint myself with myself. Mm. Um, I'd actually said on my birthday that that's what I wanted this year. I feel like my career and just sort of the trajectory of like the last six or seven years of my life has been all about like, what am I accomplishing? Like, what am I doing? It's all about like getting this job and, and getting through school and, and whatnot. And I kind of like lost me. Mm. Um, and actually around the, right, right around the time Jeff and I got back, I was supposed to start counseling with a woman in East Greenwich and I was so excited to finally be like in-person counseling with someone because I had been doing distance counseling for a while and and then she calls me and she's like we can't meet we have to meet over zoom and I was just like oh so I met this woman for the first time over zoom which I mean I love and hate it but um it sort of ended up being this like personal journey for me um I'm just really kind of finding myself Mm. Um, and having like the space to do that. Um, and I struggled a lot in the beginning feeling like this is just so selfish. Like, why am I like people are literally having the hardest time with this pandemic and here I am just like 
reflecting and like, you know, reading books about, you know, things. And, but I realized that I, I cannot, I can't be for other people what I need to be until I actually work through a lot of this stuff. So um, I'm really grateful um, for kind of the space that this has given me to like, mm -hmm. to like meet myself again. Yeah. And do you feel like had you not had the cleared schedule, lack of, you know, tons of other options of things to do, you might not have taken advantage of the time? I think it would for sure look different. Mm. Um, yeah. Just because I'm so quick to fill things with like social time, you know, like I, that it would be sort of like, well, if, if I have the choice, like I will go do something with someone else then kind of sit at home and, you know, read a book that might make me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> like make me have to say yeah. something, you know, like, <laughs> so I, yeah, I, I'm sure that this would have come to a head at some point and just in terms of like me having to face some things, but this was just like a really nice opening. Um, yeah. For that, I think. Yeah. So. Now you said like maybe you had some hesitancy before you've done some like uh, virtual counseling and stuff like that before. And I know that's still what was happening, but um, you grew up in a Christian environment, Christian home, going to church, stuff like that. Was there hesitancy to call someone to get counseling done, to figure out things in your life? Was there any, cause some, some Christians have that like negative stigma to do that. I just need to have faith. I just need to pray. Um, I actually was, I've been in therapy on and off since I was like seven. Uh, mm -hmm. I dealt with a lot of things as a kid, but, related to fear and like lack of sleep and stuff. So I was pretty familiar with it. And actually I sought it out because I just felt like part of me was missing and, and I needed somebody else to like guide me back to it. But so I felt very comfortable talking, like seeking this woman out. But the reason why I was so hesitant about the online thing is I had been doing like phone therapy with somebody for quite some time. It was somebody that I had seen in person for a long time. Um, but I now live on the East coast and he's on the West coast. So it was like, we would talk on the phone and I just had become so good at hiding. And like, I, we could talk about the things that I thought that we needed to talk about, but I was so, it was so easy to hide what I was actually thinking. Um, and I just realized that I was like selling myself short on, on actually ha like being known by a counselor who could speak like truth into my life because I was basically like controlling what was happening in the conversation, which I realized was of no benefit to me. So I really wanted to be in person with this, this woman because like it, I was almost like, I need the pressure of like, she's like in front of me staring at me. I'm probably going to cry, you know, <laughs> like yeah. that was sort of, cause I was like, what am I doing if I'm just sort of, you know, faking it really? Mm. It, it wasn't, so I knew why, that, why I knew enough about like myself. To, fake it? Hmm? Why did you feel like that pressure to like fake it, to manage it? Oh, because I've been doing that my whole life. <laughs> we're, um, we're going deep, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I also feel like the Lord's like really shown me how much, I seek other people's approval. And so even in therapy, when like, it's a confidential conversation and I was like, Oh man, this person has to think the best of me, you know? Um, and, and I'm really just trying to let that go because there's, it's just like so much bondage and, and feeling like I can somehow manipulate how you're going to feel about me. And even in like therapy, like that is hundred percent the opposite of what we're going for. And um, so that, that's just kind of, I knew, I knew enough about myself uh, to say that that would be yeah. less than helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That's courageous. I, I remember the first time uh, Jess and I got marriage counseling uh, a couple of years into our marriage and uh, we met separately and then we were going to meet, you know, together at the end of the weekend or the end of the day. And I grew up in a system, you know, uh, maybe some intentionally learned, some just like unintentionally learned. Maybe we're like, don't be honest, don't be vulnerable, like have people think that you're 
doing great all the time because you're a Christian and um, God, people should be whatever the light or something. And, um, and that emotions were evil and sinful and, you know, don't be angry and don't be sad. Mm -hmm. So um, I met with this counselor and I was not honest for the whole time. And the problem with that is my wife, who is very much the opposite of me, uh, who says what she's thinking and feeling for better or for worse, is able to process what she's thinking very quickly, is sitting in the other hour going, <laughs> oh, it's like this and it's horrible and he's like this and he does this and I'm just trying to do this and this and this. And literally I was there and, and I was like, yeah, I mean, it's not that bad you know, we have some trouble here and there, but we're doing fine. And they would probe these questions. Well, do you feel this way? I'm like, Oh no. And I literally, I wasn't honest. And I, and I felt like if I was honest about like how I felt towards my wife or whatever, that it was going to make her look bad. And that, you know, I would be like talking bad about her if I said something that had happened or whatever. And I didn't feel, even though it was a safe place, it was me being hesitant mm -hmm. and, and, it wasn't helpful at all. Yeah. And maybe the counselor knew that maybe they didn't, but it wasn't until I was willing. And this was not, no one else had control of this except me when I was willing to be like, okay, here's what's really going on. Yeah. My heart, uh, did, did help and freedom and healing come. Yeah. Well, I think that's also, it's almost like a practice of like, it is a safe space to be, to be vulnerable and to actually like say something very true and not that, cause I don't, I don't feel like my therapist is like faking her responses to me. You know, like when I'm honest with something where I'm like, Oh, this might be a little bit much. Her response is very honest to me and it's never what I think it's going to be. So it's like a really good practice of like, if I can be this honest with this person who she doesn't know me, like mm -hmm. other than what I tell her, she doesn't know me, you know? Um, and she's just not like horrified, you know, and she answers me in like a, and certainly that's not true for everyone, but it's almost like a practice of like, it's okay to express this and, and sort of trust that, you know, people are maybe aren't going to just like freak out. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's a, um, it takes some courage and I don't, and it's not even, it's, it's, it's me that needs to be willing to be like, it's okay for me to talk about this. It's good for me to talk about this. Um, and even if uh, like what I'm feeling or saying or doing or thinking is wrong to be able to process it out loud. Some people, again, are very good at being able to like self being self-aware and process. I, I do not have that ability and skill. Most often my like first response is mischaracterizing the situation. You know what I mean? And so I think for anybody like a good counselor, a good confidant, a good therapist will be able to like, take all the stuff that's there and then um, not just like let us sit in our feelings, but then point us to God, the truth, um, yeah. you know, how, how we should really think about, you know, what's true and what's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's, yeah. Cause I mean, even, I mean, the first time I met this person, we had an hour, like 50 minute conversation, like the standard therapy hour. And like at the end of it, she was like, I think, I think, you're depressed. I think you have some, de you're depressed and you have some anxiety. And I was like, part of me was like, <laughs> like you just met me. <laughs> like, what? Um, but she sort of just like synthesized even just what I told her in that first session. And it, like, that was so freeing for us going forward that it was sort of like, Oh, well that's out there now. Like, and then we kind of talked from, from that space and just to have, like you said, like somebody else, like help you process to kind of put things together is huge. Yeah. Um, so what would you say to somebody that's feeling a certain way that is either numb or like maybe having anxiety or unhappy with their situation, um, feeling, you know, maybe some, some, some bondage, prison, depression, whatever, sad. Um, I don't know. What would be like your word of encouragement to a friend? Uh, you know, if we were sitting together in the church and someone was like showing some of those characteristics that you said you were feeling like what what would you say to them as a word of encouragement pointing them to you know some wisdom i think finding a listener in your life is like huge um 
I am not a good listener. Uh, so, so don't come to me, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, just finding someone who will sit and, and just listen, because I think actually so much of what happens in my brain, when I actually say it out loud, it changes, like it completely alters that in, in just like an amazing way. And so I think to just even, it doesn't have to be someone professional, even just like find someone where you feel comfortable enough to actually just express what is in your head. Cause I think Satan is so quick to make us think that what we think is the truth, you know, and, um, and is sort of, uh, I don't know that we have to go with every thought that we have. And so I think even just being able to, to process with someone who's just going to listen and not, not really necessarily even commentate, but just to sort of give, give you the space to mm-hmm. say, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. And like, this is how I'm feeling and sort of just sit with you. Cause yeah. that is like the biggest thing I think is, is sort of letting things out so that they can, they can be changed in front of you. Yeah. I heard a quote recently that says that listening is so close to love that it's nearly indistinguishable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that was so, so true. And you can so sympathize with that. Like someone that is listening, that's not jumping in to fix it, that, that lets you like be an idiot for a little while as you're working stuff out. Um, and I think, I don't know, like I, I'm glad, I appreciate what you're saying in light of using this time. And I feel like for like everybody in our church right now, like I know some people are like swamped and busy and stuff like that. But the reality of it is, is all of us have more time than we used to. Mm -hmm. because either we're not on a commute, we're not going to fellowship at night, you know, we're not driving places, you know, et cetera. Um, So like ask God, like, God, how can I use this time right now to grow, to be closer to you, to get closer, um, you know, the people in my family and relationships. Cause I think this, I think for many people I've heard as I've talked to them, like it's revealing some holes. Yeah. You know, a marriage that, was very, you know, everybody stayed busy and the husband was working all the time. The wife was with the kids all the time. So they never had to sort out stuff. They're at home together all the time. And some of that stuff's being revealed or relationship between parents and children and stuff. And so I feel like God, as much as this pandemic is tragic and horrible and devastating and sad and crazy for so many things. And and we know that. Um, But I think for those of us that are affected by it, primarily because we have to stay home, yeah. Like, let's do some of the hard work that as soon as things start opening up again, we may miss that moment of not being in a hurry, not feeling like you said, filling our time up just because it's empty space. But to do some of that hard work, to read, to pray, to talk to someone, to be a listener, um, you know, to make the most of it. You know, I think yeah. that's a great use of the time. Yeah. You want to say anything else? Well, I was just going to say from that, <laughs> when we got home from our honeymoon, we had the two weeks, I was like, every day I was like, Lord, let me use this day, like the best, you know, and it'd be like, I napped or like, you know, we did <laughs> or whatever. Um, and I realized that almost like more importantly than sort of like feeling like there was this, like, not so much like a moment or just like a, something like tangible to to like take away, but like, what, what habits am I establishing now? Like, what are the little things to even just start? Not even that something has to be completed, but like, what did I start in those two weeks that I've carried on? Or like, you know, so, cause it felt so like so much pressure. Like I have these two full weeks where I literally cannot leave my house. Like, how do I make the most of it? And it was sort of, it was, it felt weird that it was like small things, you know, but that is where we have to start. So I think, you know, not putting so much pressure that like this pandemic is going to change me like immensely by the end of <laughs> the month, you know, it, it's just all these small things. And, yeah. and I really think that like God honors those small things. Amen. Yeah. Sowing and reaping. And as we learned in like the cumulative effect stuff, small, seemingly insignificant things, easy to do, easy to yeah, not do. To do yeah. you know? And that might be even like calling somebody for counseling. Mm-hmm. that's easy to do but it's easy not to do yeah. showing up for the next appointment um sitting down praying with your spouse easy to do it easy not to do go ahead well no i was gonna say just in, for anybody who's thinking about it 
go into it knowing that the first time is terrible. Like the, fir- the first time is terrible, but don't, don't go expecting that it's going to be amazing. It's probably going to be really awkward and uncomfortable. Mm. And like, that's okay. Like mm-hmm. it was for me. And I've done this a lot. This first time meeting this woman, I burst into tears because I was so nervous. Mm. Like, you know, it, so just like be very gracious to yourself if that is what you choose to pursue because um, it gets easier as most things. It's just really hard as adults to appreciate that like the first time is going to be as awkward as it was when we were kids. Like it's just, it's, it's awkward. Yeah. So own it. No, that's, good. <laughs> you know? that's good. Yeah. Um, good and important things are hard and they're hard at the beginning. It's hard to go to the gym the first time. It's hard to run that first mile. You know, a lot of first year of marriages are really hard, you know, but perseverance, sticking it out and, and having the long-term view. Yeah. Amen. Hey, it's a blast talking to you. Yeah, this is great. And if anybody needs somebody to talk to, find somebody <laughs> else. Best <laughs> line. So, yeah. I'm working on the listening. Oh <laughs> uh, boy. Hey, thanks so much. I can't wait till we're all back together. Agreed. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Living Faith at Home podcast. If you'd like more information about Living Faith Christian Church, visit us online at livingfaithri.org.